the talk will uh, last about two, two hours, maybe it less to give some time for questions. Uh, during this time, I will uh, dissect the view of uh, the film Triumph of the Will by Lenny Rechtenstaff, which is a famous piece of uh, Nazi Hitler propaganda, um, to show you how desire is engaged through the technology of cinema. And we will use this understanding to also see how the same technologies are used today by Trump in through Twitter. The question kind of at the back of my mind that I want to understand is who are the people who support a fascist regime? What kind of person? And the answer I'm giving it to you straight away, the answer that I'm going to want to explore is that people who support fascism are not those who are politically conservative. They are those who are sexually conservative. And sexual conservatism, once it gets manipulated by contemporary technology, creates a very potent explosive mix. Now, once you understand that, you can also figure out what shape alternative politics can take. Just as in the age before the internet, we learned to decipher the semiotics of language, the semiotics of, of images, we learned to read what images mean. We also Roland Barth had his book, Mythologies, or Hammer Lucida, and, and, and Bergen had this thinking photography, all these various books that teach you how to read images and understand them. This is not what's going to help. What's going to help is to, to read performance semiotic, read the semiotic meaning of performance. Okay, so we look at the meaning of, uh, sorry, we look, at, we look at the meaning of information, we look at the meaning of politics, finally the meaning of life, and the meaning of art. Technology is life. Technology is not a... I used to get annoyed when people take photographs, then I used to get flattered. Now I don't care. That's not the effects of technology. Uh, but I did suspect that by taking the picture, you allow yourself to somehow, you, you distance yourself from what is going on. Uh, so technology is life. It's not an instrument for life. It's not a, a tool for life. Technology is life. Think, for instance, of Dolly the sheep, a living, breathing creature created in a laboratory. Yeah? Now, in a sense, we are all Dolly the sheep. We are all laboratory creatures in different ways. So, for all of us, technology and life are interchangeable. They are basically the same thing. Before technology, Bodies and machines are separate. Human beings knew what is human and what is non human. What is a piece of equipment, like a hammer, and what is a living organism. In age technology, bodies are machines, and machines are bodies. Every one of the bodies in this room also has machinic parts, from the metal in your teeth to the antibiotics in your bodies, uh, to the um, artificial uh, limbs, and uh, corneas, and uh, transfusions, um, and the extensions of your body, such as your smartphone that carries your memory, for instance, or your cloud that carries your uh, history. Um, so the body is a machine in the age of technology. To be a loser in this age is to believe in individuality. Is to believe that you have an individuality and that it matters. That's how you become a loser. Power is the ability to form human, non-human collectives, to create assemblages between humans and non-humans that create bridges between digital and non-digital entities. It is the ability to collaborate with outsiders, whistleblowers, deserters, prospects. It's the ability to transcend 
limitations of gender, species, age, identity. Um, that's it. That was, um, that really is everything there is to know about the, the situation we are in now. And now, once you know where I'm coming from and where I stand, we can begin the lecture. Okay, ready to begin? So, um, now I'm in, in this talk, the first thing I kind of wanted to establish is why I made the claim that the foundation of fascism is repressed desire. Um, so, in order to establish that, I, I, I kind of want to make it absolutely clear. First, I think that the question of fascism is the urgent and pressing question of the present. I take it as a given that fascist movements are on the rise in different parts of the world. And, uh, and I think there is a sense of urgency to try to figure out why it happens. Now, in the 1930s, when fascism was on the rise across Europe um, for the first time, uh, a number of philosophers and psychoanalysts and economists were trying to understand this phenomenon. Two of them, who I'm going to mention extensively during this talk, are one, Theodor Adorno, who was a member of the Frankfurt Group and um, looked extensively at the rise of fascism. Uh, and the other is William Reich. William Reich, who is a very uh, fascinating, enigmatic figure in the history, in, in, in this history. He was uh, one of the first disciples of Freud. He was a doctor, a psychoanalyst. Uh, but he was also quite insane in his uh, uh, imagination. He wrote a wonderful book that's called The Mass um, <laughs> um, the, uh, the Mass Psychology of Fascism. Mass Psychology of Fascism. And then the book which I'm going to draw from. But uh, and he wrote it in 1933 when he was still in Europe. When he immigrated to the USA, um, he started to, um, he thought that he discovered this universal source of energy, kind of dark matter, uh, that is, uh, that is the, the orgasmic energy, the orbital. And he's, he built this uh, organ like accumulators, which were uh, boxes that you could uh, walk in and sit, and they were supposed to accumulate orgasmic energy. And he claimed that they can heal cancer, and they can, you know, many, many very famous people had these uh, organ accumulators in their houses that sort of still, they still have a kind of a cult following till this day. But because he, uh, they were never, because his kind of medical claims, were never proven. He got into trouble with the American licensing uh, authorities, sort of the the the, 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 the drug and pharmaceutical authorities, and um, the FBI ended up confiscating all these machines and destroying them. And also, the FBI burned about seven tons of his books in one of the most extreme acts of uh, cultural vandalism. Uh, all his uh, books were uh, torched. And he actually died in prison in USA, in prison for uh, uh, for his uh, for his sort of uh, claims that he that were unsubstantiated. But uh, that's sort of the end of his life. As I said, an incredibly uh, fascinating figure. Uh, but I'm I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that. And I know that some people here in the audience probably came because they wanted to hear about the uh, organ accumulators. That would not be the topic of this conversation. We're going to talk mostly about his book uh, on the um, on mass um, on the psychology of mass fascism. Um, so, so the first thing to maybe talk about very briefly is how what where is the connection between oppression and fascism? In this book, The Psychology of Mass Fascism, um, William Wright asks a very simple question. He says, how come masses of 
people desire what is so evidently bad for them. White people want more oppression, more domination, more control, less freedom, less uh, opportunity, more censorship, more policing. How come people desire what is bad for them? There's really very little, there's hardly any argument that fascism is not good for you. So why do people want it so much? That was the question he, uh, he was asking. And to answer that, he used Freud's, uh, the understanding of repression that Freud developed um, in 1920s and 1930s in his writings on sexuality. Freud had his book, Three Essays on Sexuality, uh, that includes the essay, The Ego and the E, and, um, and the essay on the narcissistic personality, and, uh, and his essay on um, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, when he talks about the libido. Now, just so you know, what is the libido? Libido is an important Freudian concept. Libido is, you know how when you are hungry, you have a craving for food. Yeah? So, libido is the same thing but for sex. It's a craving. Yeah? So, so that is very important to my Libido is a, a, a particular craving. Now, um, Freud was really quite the anarchist in his thinking. And I, 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 even today, the, the essence of his argument is shocking for many people. So I will try to present it to you in the most direct way, and you will do with it later what you wish. But um, Freud basically says that the human child, the development of the human child, unlike, let's say, the development of, is different from the development of a cat or, let's say, a, a bird. And every animal undergoes a stage of sexual maturation where their sex organs grow and develop and become active. So it happens to cats, it happens to birds, it happens to bees. However, in humans, that was Freud's great insight. In, hu in humans, there is not one period of sexual maturation, but two. The first one, I mean, or the second one, everyone knows, that's sort of the, you know, the, the, the famous teenage years when a boy starts to grow chest hair and their voice deepens and they start to get erections. And, uh, and um, so that is sort of around the age of, I don't know, between 8 and 12 or 14, roughly it's slightly different between uh, boys and girls. This age of sexual maturation is recognized and policed and, you know, there's a lot of literature about it. But Freud discovered another age of sexual, another age of intense sexual activity that takes place, anyone knows when? Of course you don't, because you don't remember. It takes place between the ages of zero and three. Freud said, basically, that up, to, up roughly to the age of three, you have only one thought of your mind. is how to have as much sex as possible. You have no other interest than the libido. Now, he makes some fantastic arguments, which I think he, he, he really had a brilliant mind. It was um, in his very, very famous, the cocaine papers, the so-called, because uh, he was a heavy user of, uh, of cocaine and it helped him uh, to write. Um, he, um, he says, isn't it interesting that we don't remember anything from the first three years of our life? He says, but why is that? It's because our memory was suddenly so weak, and I said, I didn't buy it. This is the age where all our uh, intellectual capacities are being continuously developed. So how come we don't remember anything from this? Is it because it was so far away? No, because even when we are at 10 or 15, we don't remember anything that happened. Even if it was like only 10 years ago. But you still remember very well what happened to you 10 years ago from now. So how come the first three years of your life uh, of the four years are shredded in this 
veil of darkness. How can you hardly remember anything at all? He said, yeah, yes. You don't remember anything because you're ashamed to remember. Because all you were interested in was sex. And because later on you learn to understand that sex is shameful and bad and something to be embarrassed about, and your parents and society and teachers did a very good job explaining to you how, how shameful sex is, you repressed all the memory of how you craved sex as a little baby. So we'll go to this in, 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 in some detail in a little while. But here is one example, uh, just to give you the sense of Freud's uh, line of life, sort of his, his uh, thinking on, on this topic. Um, he says, it's interesting how most little boys, and I don't want to show off hands, but how most little boys want to be train drivers when they're small. Uh, why is that? He says, well, they want to be train drivers because of the vibration, because of the shaking of the train. This is precisely the, the, the masturbatory effect that they crave sitting on the, sort of, on the bouncing seat of the tram or a bus or a train creates a sexual feeling that gives pleasure. So, so little boys all want to be train drivers and, and walk around carrying sort of a, a wooden train on a string or you know, anything else because that associates in their mind with pleasure. What happens then? Then when they become sort of adolescents, 12 or 14 or, or 13 or 14, they go on the train and they feel sick, they vomit, they have trouble sickness, motion sickness. Why is that? For instance, it's because now they are being told to feel disgusted with the cravings and the pleasure that got out of this shaking. So the same shaking that used to be so enjoyable when they were three or four is now experienced by them as disgusting and revolting, and they vomit and their motion sickness. So that is quite interesting, isn't it? Not what you sort of not what you expect to read in a nicely referenced academic paper in the academic journal. Um, and I can tell by the look on some of your faces that not everyone likes it, and not everyone somehow, you know, is prepared to agree with it. And Freud would say, but this is exactly the proof of the fact of that, that I write. Because it's natural, it's completely normal that you would have a very antagonistic, very negative response to these claims. You are, you must <coughs> insist that no, my child was pure. I was not like that. Um, that is the the perfect example of the cultural conditioning that you experience. So, um, to give a little bit more detail to the to this moment, to the three-year, zero to three-year uh, period of child life, and where is the libidinal element in that? So, the first sexual experience of the child is the the sucking of the nipple. So the first sexual experience is the oral one. The nipple, whether the mother or the wet nurse, provides nourishment, so it's basically life-giving, because it's the milk. It also gives the pleasure of the suck. Yeah? Now, after the nipple is taken away, many children develop a thumb sucking habit. And Freud looks at, and looks at that very carefully, says children often suck their own thumb, sometimes they suck uh, their toe, because that helps them. They will even happily suck someone else's thumb, because they associate sucking with pleasure. So it's a first stage, nourishment and pleasure are combined, but then even without the nourishment, the sucking is experienced as pleasure. And those of you who were enthusiastic thumb suckers are quite likely to be smokers, or chewing gum, or doing various other things that 
kind of remind you of this pleasure of the of the nourishing you. Now, that is the first element. What is happening, by the way, is that at some point, pleasurable this sun as it is, the nipple is taken away because mother needs to start going to work and because, you know, um, at some point, one has to be weaned from the, from the sun. And obviously the little baby cannot comprehend why something that gives so much pleasure and doesn't hurt anyone is taken away. The experience of that is of an acute trauma. This trauma also doesn't go away, according to Freud, and that is the structure of the unconscious. According to Freud, the unconscious never changes. It's not like something there gets erased or covered. The trauma you experience in the age of six months, when the needle was taken away, is still there, it still hurts. Now, some parents manage to manage this trauma in a more considered way, others in a less considered way, and based on the way this trauma is managed, you grow up either fixated on orality or more able to somehow integrate your trauma into your everyday life. So that's the first trauma, the oral one. The second trauma comes about a um, few, uh, maybe a year and a half later, and that's the anal one. And that is to do with uh, the child having to learn how to use the toilet. In the beginning, the child just wears a nappy and is kind of permitted to defecate whenever they want. And it's also considered, you know, a wonderful thing they do, they defecate and everyone says, oh, how oh, wonderful, you know. Um, and, um, and the child <coughs> learns, again, that's Freud, learns to receive or to, uh, to achieve a, a anal simulation, anal pleasure through this defecation. Um, but later on, at some point again, the others come and say, no, bad baby, stop doing that, you know, go, go to the party. Now, this also is an incredible shift in what is expected from the child. Until, until this point, their own kind of natural processes resulted in this expulsion, in this evacuation, and that was absolutely normal, and everyone received it with happiness and kindness. Um, and, you know, they had so much to give. You know, like, like any good artist, they had, they had so much to sort of, and it just comes out of them, it cost them nothing, you know? And everyone loved it and received it with open arms. For that reason, the connection between art and shit is a very strong one. They might not be able to get into it um, today. Uh, but uh, at some point, again, bad baby, what have you done? You saw the bed, you saw your underwear, you know? Bad baby. And the baby, of course, doesn't understand why suddenly it's bad. They just learn that what they are is dirty and shameful. That is the understanding that the person carries with them for the rest of their life. That is the anal trauma. Now again, it can be managed by some parents with kindness, or it can be managed by other parents in a very harsh and disciplinary way. So uh, if you know colleagues or if you know people around you whose desk is always neat and tidy, and all the pencils are in a row and sharpened, and the, no, the notepad is exactly in the middle of the table. These people, their anal trauma was not managed very well. Again, that's what okay, that's the problem. And they were, they are obsessively organizing everything. And they demonstrate how that they are good kids, and they are really clean, and they didn't do anything, they didn't soil the bed, and everything is really in the right place, you know? And this obsessive compulsive behavior, according to Freud, is to do with being punished simply for being who they are in this uh, bad day of, of about two years. Now, um, it's also, Freud says, that it's interesting how at, at this age, when, when children are told to go to um, use the toilet, many also um, have real problems. Going to it, and some, some children clench their buttock muscles for days, holding in, not letting out the excrement. And, it says, and that's because they, they learn that by holding in and, and, and in that way exercising uh, pressure on the rectal muscles, they can achieve sexual pleasure. Yeah? 
So Freud has, a, has an extensive, very interesting chapter about the, um, the a kind of analogy of, uh, of um, children in this age. Now the next, the next trauma, which I'm not going to go into because I still want to, to move on. The next trauma is the Oedipal one. And that is um, to do with the, with the fear of castration, with, um, with the moment when the child uh, and that happens around age of four or five, wants to make a child himself, wants himself to have a child like their parents have, and, and somehow tries to um, make some kind of steps towards it, which always ends in failure. The point is that all these sexual experiences of, um, of a young child, that is their life. Freud has a wonderful um, term to describe uh, babies or children of this age, zero to four year old, he calls them polymorphically perverse, which means the child, every part of the child's body, every part of the child's body is a vehicle of sexual gratification. And for that reason, it is, it is a perversion because the parent is someone who derives sexual satisfaction not from the normal intercourse. Yeah, that's in, in Freud's language. So polymorphous perverse, so poly polymorphous perversity is the condition in which every physical activity is also a sexual activity. For a child, everything they do is libido. It's about pleasure. Later on, they learn that this is a very bad way to be, and they are being punished for sleeping with their hands uh, in their pajamas, or they are punished for those things. They are punished for, uh, you know, uh, being uh, sexually curious, or touching themselves inappropriately, touching, uh, touching someone else. And um, and uh, I just saw someone sent me a picture of their uh, niece. Uh, she's four year old from from my kindergarten in in, in the states. And all the kids are sitting kind of in a row, uh, and and this girl and the and the boy next next to her, they're not they're not facing the camera, but they kind of um, French kissing basically. Uh, well, I was I drew a really beautiful picture, and she kind of went into sort of uh, two to it. It was really it was astonishing. And uh, I asked the girl later on Skype, I asked, um, "What were you doing?" To them. We were tasting each other's tongues. And I think that is a very good um, example. I mean, that, 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 that illustrates uh, Freud's point very well. That is, that is what child's existence is. But of course, very soon what will happen to this girl, as well as what happened to all of us, unless they are kind of lucky to be brought up by particularly enlightened parents, is that they learn that these behaviors are inappropriate, that they may not behave in this way. The tasting something as a stump is a bad thing. And with that comes guilt, with that comes shame, and that's where we go back to the right. If your sexual urges are being repressed, particularly harsh, and if you are being told in non certain things, this is a dirty, nasty behavior. If, if on top of that, you're also being told that this behavior will land you in prison, or in hell, or in the back of the class, or you will become a homosexual, or something like that, you start to associate massive sense of guilt and shame with everything to do with pleasure. And once your sense of pleasure. Once pleasure is something you can only do in secret, must wait behind closed door. You know, keep it all under wraps. Not show your emotions. Bold it up. You know, once you become this strong and quiet type, you know, you become a right material for fascist propaganda. That is. The, uh, the, the, the William Wright thesis. Now, um, I can take here a quick pause and take questions if you like, or I can move on 
to the next part. What would you like? Questions or no more? No questions. Uh, uh, I mean, so like different people mature sexually. No. It's, it's even we talk about the zero to three year olds. Everyone undergoes exactly the same process. Everyone has to first learn how to suck and then how to stop sucking. No, but after that. Not only after that. I'm just talking about zero to three years. Okay. Any other questions? But even then, even after that, yeah, everyone is different, but you know, if you look at the at book of medicine, for instance, everyone is different, and yet the book of medicine says. This is where the appendix is, this is where the leg is, that's how you do a knee operation. When it comes out, how can you say you do a knee operation? Everyone is different. Has anyone studied um, like, you know, those communities, like, you know, that after something that's a completely different question. The answer is yes, study, and uh, you can do your work. Yes. Yes. How do you then negotiate the inequality of power between the parent and child in so called enlightened parent uh, child relationship? I don't know. Examples where that power has been abused. So you mean, are you saying that enlightened parents can also abuse yes. their parents? So they might consider themselves. Oh, I think, yeah, they can uh, fantastically abuse. And, um, yeah, so, um... Under this argument, could you argue, not that I believe it, that then to not have all this drama happen, like, in sense, is what Look, uh, Freud speaks a lot about this. It's, it's, not, it's not in the scope of this lecture to go into it. Interest is a very interesting topic. You can read his uh, essay, Totem and Taboo. Totem oh. and Taboo. On that, I, I, I really cannot go into that. It will, um, I, I just want to take some questions on what I discussed. Bear in mind that I was just trying to, put, to, to elucidate some of Freud's arguments in uh, the Ego and the Eve and, um, and some of the essay on the child sexuality. Yes. Can you put it again how um, the accumulation of shame and pleasure um, make people react more passively uh, to passion? That will be the, that I will do in the second part. Oh, okay. That that comes. Yes. So right, um, reading a story yes. that um, this pleasure is only something they built. What about the pleasure that the child has in that control? They are not shamed by it at the time, but they later learn to understand it is shame. Um, it's not a reprogramming of pleasure. It's, it's like complete. No, there is a programming. The, the, the small child, which is still is between the age of zero and three, is quite immune to being proper. It is not properly socialized. It's kind of quite autonomous in the sense that it just does what it is. But later on, once socialization starts taking place through parenting, schooling, they come to learn from their teachers and their parents and their peers that everything that gives them pleasure is shame. Now, it's true that different societies uh, will handle this process differently. Freud was looking at the society of the bourgeois Vienna of the beginning of the 20th century. It's not, you know, million miles away from society, we'll be fine. But there are other societies that do it in a different way. So that is that, that, that is true. Yes? It's zero to three also the age where like, fetishes and food and sex and things like that are not the same uh, That's not when they arise, but that's um, uh, food fetish, uh, feet fetish, all the other, or uh, sadomasochism, this will be, according to Freud, the, that's how these um, experiences of pleasure from this age, that's how they get sublimated. 
and, and if because of because a person were not properly weaned of these behaviors, not properly socialized, let's say excessively punished for you know not going to toilet on the time, this kind of person might grow up in the Freudian uh, way of thinking with an ex excessive need to be punished. The punishment, because in, in the little child, this punishment was connected to some form of pleasure and always followed pleasure, they now will be seeking punishment as an adult because there is the already programmed in a way that punishment is linked to pleasure. Yeah, so, and that's, that should, and Freud actually says, isn't it interesting that normally the, the object that, that cause fetish or that uh, evolved fetish, such as feet and hair, are the, the smelly parts of the body. So the fetish process is always for the smelly parts, because that was a, a trigger, to use a modern, <laughs> a modern word, a trigger for a, for a, for a little child. It was a, it was a very sensual dimension of the body, that it smells. Okay, now if that is okay with you, uh, that was really just a preliminary because with what we learned now, with what we discussed, I want to turn to um, Brian Truitt, the film by the amazing Lenny Trickenstall, and um, is an exemplary film of Nazi propaganda. It is exemplary as propaganda, it's exemplary as a film, it is very powerful, it is also very unpleasant. So, trigger warning, uh, if you are, I guess I guess I have to give you a trigger warning earlier as well, but, but if you are going to be um, affected by issues of, uh, you know, um, by um, shiny boots and stuff like that, then maybe it's not for you. Uh, I am affected by it, it's, it's not... It's, it's difficult to watch, it's difficult because it's such a powerful cinema. Uh, I think part of what we have to do as uh, artists and philosophers is to go where it is unpleasant. You know, and just like doctors, we have to look at things that don't look particularly nice. That's, that's part of the work. Um, so, uh, for, for, many, for a very long time this film was banned and it was hard to, uh, to get hold of it. Now it is freely available on um, YouTube. So I just want to show you a few tiny pieces because we're going now to see how the um, notion of desire is going is, is structured or built into the uh, into the film. Um, and at the back of my mind is all the time thinking about Trump's. Weeks. Actually, let's go back. Let's look at one of Bill William Wright's uh, quotations. Um, yeah, this is, this is from Mass Psychology of Fascism. It gives you a bit of a taste how Wright thinks. Under lower middle class influence, the women developed an attitude of resignation which covered up repressed sexual rebellion. The sons developed in addition to a submissive attitude towards authority, a strong identification with the father, which later becomes identification with any kind of authority. So do you see, to answer your question, how the link starts to be established? Yes. Repression of sexual desire creates a sense of strong authority, and then you seek this authority, because somehow authority becomes linked with desire. Even though this desire is repressed, authority is you. And, and as the question that the tribe was asking is, how come people want to be more, more repressed? How come people seek to be, uh, to have more domination? Well, because they, because of the um, repression of their sexual urges as children, they come to associate repression with pleasure. They means us. Yeah? So, okay, now we can go back uh, to the film. Uh, so first...
does Star Wars get their opening credits from? people all 
waving. That is the Messages. 
it won't be able to absorb. And here you see it's it's all done without using a board. <laughs> Long before the words come to pass, it was all 
in the in the imagery that uh, that we that we saw, uh, and then quite sort of common common stuff of uh, political propaganda is our total belief in ourselves. Now that makes me think of Trump. Truth is the foundation on which the power of the press stands and falls. Reporting the truth about Germany is our only demand of the press, including the foreign press. Yeah. But I showed you earlier what truth means in the age of technology. Yeah. That is the trick. The demand for truth is, is a call. Because what is actually passing as truth is a form of excitement, is a form of performance. Yeah. And as I said earlier, you cannot combat performance, or you cannot combat performativity with representation. You, can, you, you cannot combat imagination with facts. You need to have an authority. Fascist leaders seem to understand it very well. Uh, wherever we look, building work is going on. All our work must be inspired by one idea. To make the German worker an upright, proud, and equal comrade. So, I think, I mean, this, um, it's probably, um, I can move on from here. We maybe don't need to look anymore at any uh, written stuff. But I want now to talk about how the, what is happening in this film in a slightly more philosophical, in a slightly more philosophical dimension. So, A equals A, that is the foundational principle of representation. Representational thinking, logical thinking, rationality, um, the ego, if you like, in, in, in the more Freudian dimension of it, operates on the principle of identity. Identity is the principle that something can only be that thing, it cannot be something else. That seems quite a simple thing to say, yeah? The power, the, 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 the power cable is not a laptop, the laptop is not a powerful cable. That's how, that's why we can operate as civilized people. I can call someone and say, can you please send me a power cable? And I'm pretty sure to get that and not this. Yeah? So this identification of objects seems to be very useful and massively important for progress and building and advancing <coughs> industrial society. But what happens when A equals A also becomes the foundational principle of politics? It then suggests that exactly the same formula that makes so much sense in the everyday ordering of the cable, yeah? the same formula, formula also suggests that you are, either you are one of us, either you are with us or against us, either you are one of us, either you are identical to us, or you are not identical, and then you are not one of us. So that might take a tiny bit of exploration to position it uh, on, on, a, on a slightly better footing. But um, it's, um, it wasn't really Adorno, Theodore Adorno in his book, uh, Negative Dialectics, he said, the degree to which society slides into fascism can be measured by the way it treats, it treats the other. It treats the one who falls outside the identical. So, if you imagine a society in which the emphasis is on that everyone, whoever they are, are welcome and have uh, complete rights, like, you know, the, the sign happens between them. Um, that is a, a country that is completely immune to any fascist propaganda. Because everyone is welcome. 
your white, your black, your orange, your your differently able, your disabled, your gay, your straight, your queer, you know, everyone is welcome. It's great, you know? A society like this, Adorno says, not going to become fascist. Why? Because fascism is built on A equal A, on the principle of identity, also known as representation, on the principle of exclusion of the other. If, on the other hand, you imagine a society in which the immigrant is dangerous, the trans person are dangerous, the queer are seen with suspicion, the black are seen as criminals, the Mexicans seen as you know, spreading drugs and disease. A society like that, Adorno says, is already well on the way to having a fascist mentality. Because I think it should be quite clear by now, fascism is not about having a dictator at the top of the pyramid. There are many countries with dictatorships that don't necessarily become fascist. Uh, like, um, for instance, uh, modern day China or uh, Mugabe's uh, Zimbabwe, that was an authoritarian country, but for whatever reason, not a fascist one. So fascism is not about a fascist, uh, it's not about the leadership. Fascism happens when the people, the people, the masses want. That is what's so scary about fascism. And that's what makes it also so similar to democracy. Because like democracy, fascism is a mass movement. That is also, I think, quite confusing for many people. So for Adorno, the test of how fascism is serving society is, is the extent to which it, it can accommodate difference. And where, how technology fits into that? So, uh, <coughs> are you okay? Uh, the, so, this is like a uh, longer quotation from a short essay by Adorno, uh, Freudian Theory and the Pattern of Fascist Propaganda, which he wrote in the 1950s, trying to understand the fascist movements in USA, where he lived at the time. So, uh, I will read it here, not like reading the slides, but I will read it too, because I think it's maybe a little small. Or can you read it? Should I read it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the tendency to, three, to thread on those below, which manifests itself so disastrously in persecution of weak and helpless minorities, is as outspoken as the hatred against those outside. In practice, both tendencies quite frequently fall together. Freud's theory sheds light on the all-pervasive, rigid distinction between the beloved in-group and the rejected out-group. Throughout our culture, this way of thinking and behaving has come to be regarded as self-evident to such a degree that the question of why people love what is like themselves and hate what is different is rarely asked seriously enough. So this is in Adorno's typical, quite condensed and complex uh, language. But essentially, he says, to put it simply, why A equal A? Why we so wholeheartedly embrace representation? Why we never question the cable as a cable and the laptop as a laptop? Because it is, of course, very useful with you to order an object, but we somehow apply exactly the same approach to people. And people, you know, so we basically start to treat people like objects. When we treat people like objects, the consequences are disastrous for the people. There is another uh, quotation from Adorno, 
from a wonderful book of his short uh, epigrams, Minima Moralia, um, where he talks about the way technology, or just getting behind the wheel of the car, already makes you a beautiful fascist. I think it's quite a well-known um, sentence from this, from this book. And which driver is not tempted, merely by the power of his engine, to wipe out the vermin of the street, pedestrians, children, cyclists? Why is that? Because you are behind the wheel of this machine. It, you have the power. You, you were given the engine. You were given the gas pedal. You just want to push it, you know? And you have the ability. <coughs> and then other slower people with whom you share the road, they just get in the way of all this power you have. So just getting behind the wheel of the automobile already makes you a bit of a problem. It's interesting, isn't it? That this way of thinking. And he also says in the same section, he says, how the fact that windows these days need to be slumped, how it changes us. The fact that there is uh, no gap between the street and the house, you just step from the street into the house. There are no like, porticos or steps or into driveway. Um, how these small ways by which the environment becomes more efficient, more productive, uh, less uh, accommodating, how it affects our own psyche, how it changes. So, uh, and here is something from um, Adorno's essay, Freudian Theory in Part of Polish Propaganda, where he, I think, in a sense, helps to explain the Lenin-Fischel spell. Um, in the group, the individual is brought under condition which allow him to throw repressing of his unconscious instincts. Those who become submerged in masses are not primitive men, but display primitive attitudes contradictory to their normal, rational behavior. And I think you really can see in um, section that I didn't show you yet of <laughs> Trying harder, paying attention, you know, um, doing better. 
you know, behaving yourself, eating straight, not slouching. Um, that's the that's that's the super ego. The ego is the rationalized, socialized, normative part of the psyche that learned how to behave in accordance with social norms. It's that part that developed out of this polymorphously um, erotic uh, baby. And, and then there is the need, which is the part of the psyche that is unconscious, that is happening uh, without the conscious, the rational ego being aware of it, and only coming out at night, usually in dreams. Yeah? So the, the ego is active all day long, making sure that you behave in a normal way. I don't want to get sectioned or hospitalized or given drugs if you don't behave in a normal, so socially acceptable way. The ego is also trying to keep the unconscious in check at night as well, um, censoring the dreams and not letting the unconscious to fully come out. But, that, but because the ego also needs to rest, you know, it's only human, um, it sometimes kind of falls asleep um, and then the E bursts out and then you have dreams. For, for Freud, the dream was a royal way to the unconscious, precisely because the images that you see in the dream are the uncensored elements of, the, of your libido, of your E that come out. So, what Freud was saying, what, what Adorno was saying in his previous quotation is that the fascist model allows, legitimizes these primitive expressions of the E to come out in a way that is not embarrassed, in a way that is legitimate, in a way that is not um, criticized. And I think the, we can see something. I just think that all of them will be there in just a few years. And that's what Wright is asking. Why do people desire fucking so much? They know it's going to kill. They must know. They must know that fascism means war, it means hunger, it means hardship, um, it means the Gestapo. So what do you get in return? So that's, I think, where, where the answer is coming soon. So this is a very atavistic game, very primitive. It's exactly what we were looking at in the in, in what Adorno is saying, that a group situation where that allows you to throw repressing off the unconscious. You don't need to repress the unconscious. You can be the horse, or the rider, or both, you know? And the eat is allowed to roam free. That is an incredibly seductive, tempting moment. It's a kind of moment that if you don't want to go to a, to a, to a Trump rally, or to a, to, to a fascist military camp, you can experience by going to a Finnish club. Because Finnish clubs are also spaces where you can throw away the social norms and experience or allow your he, he to um, to you know to go out and play. Um, for to choose your finish but wisely because many of them are kind of, uh, have hand parties these days. Um, but um, but that is the the real idea behind the carnival or the fetish club uh, or let's say speak easy or a, a diet 
Okay, so just one more from Adobe. Since the libidinal bond between members of the masses is obviously not of an un uninhibited sexual nature, the problem arises as to which psychological mechanisms transform primary sexual energy into feelings which hold masses together. That is the challenge of a fascist thing. What you need to do if you are a, a if you try to become a fascist leader, you need to learn how to transform repressed sexual desire into feelings that hold people together. And what seems to be uh, the case is that the more people are sexually repressed, the easier it, the easier it is to control. For that reason, fascism seems to be the strongest in countries where sexual repression is the greatest. So maybe it is not an accident that fascism is uh, taking hold in the USA, where the religious education and uh, religious conservatism is, uh, is quite strong. And Freud, in society and his discontents after the First World War, was writing about the shape of the gardens in Germany and how the private gardens are so carefully manicured and really nicely arranged, very neat. And he says, it's because the gardens are so neat, because no, nothing is allowed to just grow, nothing is allowed to, uh, you know, just happen. That's why fascism was possible. And then he compares it to the English garden, that is quite overgrown and chaotic, and you know, that sort of weeds, and, uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't sort of properly uh, weeded for a long time, and it's kind of quite messy. It seems to be a safer place, because here um, there's less restriction, there's less limitations on desire. You look at these pictures of, uh, of small town America, of these white little houses with a very tiny little crop garden. And you know, according to what um, Adorno and uh, Freud are saying, this is not a really good. This is a good breeding ground for fascism when you have one white church, several streets, little houses. And, um, and Reich adds to that, to that his analysis. He says, fascism is neither working class nor middle class. It will in a sense, it, it finds a way to appeal to both. For the working classes, it becomes the, the proletarian movement uh, that, that failed in its Marxist iteration. For the middle classes, it appeals because it promises to crush the big business. Big business, and that was the reason for that, that was the cause of, of the recession in the 30s, uh, and one of the reasons for the uh, rise of the Nazi party in Germany, the uh, big business, like the Krupp's Corporation and the Mercedes-Benz, uh, were swallowing small businesses, and the middle classes were becoming impoverished. And um, part of the genius of the Nazi propaganda was to attract the middle classes to the Nazi cause by promising to crush big business. And that is something that has a strong resonance right now. In this time, um, the middle classes are being crushed by technology and automation and things like um, Amazon and uh, Uber. And, um, but then, the moment the middle classes become uh, susceptible to the fascist ideology, um, there is a switch happening and the big business is brought back again uh, as providers of jobs. So what, what the fascist movement succeeds in doing, which Marxist movements normally fail, it succeeds in overcoming the dichotomy between working class and middle class. It succeeds in somehow um, removing the antagonism, saying we are all in it together, 
the worker and the business owner, we are united. Instead of hating each other, we are hating the other. We are hating the one that is outside the A equal A. Yeah. That is the, the political hinge of the fascist movement. Or it always has to identify the other against whom the proletariat and the middle classes have to unite in hate. Now, finally, just before uh, we open for questions, on the character of the leader himself. And here I want to speak specifically about Trump. Um, and Freud, in his early book on the, on the narcissistic personality, says that a fascist leader works like a hypnotist. A hypnotist knows how to hypnotize the individual, and a fascist leader knows how to hypnotize the masses. So you might think, well, you know, people in a rally, uh, in Trump rally, are not hypnotized. It's true. But you don't need full hypnosis <coughs> to create a state of trance. It might be that some of you here right now are already in a state of trance. Uh, it's, it, it actually takes very little to evoke a state of trance in people. Anything rhythmic, repetitious, um, that has a certain um, beat to it, uh, chanting, for instance, can induce states of trance. They can be quite mild. It doesn't mean that you forget who you are, but it means that you are slightly, to some extent, under someone else's control. And then I'm thinking about the chance that often accompany Trump's rallies, you know, lock her up, for instance. This kind of chance. Their purpose is not so much to actually do anything, because even though he was always chanting with his crowds, lock her up, uh, saying he will block uh, Hillary Clinton when he comes to power. He did nothing of that sort. Because that was not the point of the chant. The point of the chant was the chant. The chant is the point, not the message. Again, it's not the words that the matter here, but the rhythmic repetition. That's what creates this sense of togetherness. That's what's creating the kind of the ego chamber. And through that, the rational ego dissolves or steps to one side, and the, the sexual urges of the Eve are allowed to come forward. So, <clears throat> by, the measures, by the measures that he takes, the hypnotist awakens in the subject a portion of his archaic inheritance, which had also made him complain towards his parents, and which had experienced an individual reanimation in his relation to his father. What is thus awakened is the idea of a paramount and dangerous personality towards whom only a passive masochistic attitude is possible, to whom one's will has to be surrendered, while to be alone with him, to look him in the face, appears a hazardous enterprise. In order to allow narcissistic identification, the leader has to appear himself as absolutely narcissistic. And here is the secret, I think, to many of the strange behaviors of people like Trump. And you often wonder when you surely he, he will be called out for all these ridiculous behaviors. You know, like even like sort of the, the famous um, Hollywood sex tape that, uh, that kind of, uh, emerged before the um, the, the, the presidential election. But actually, it all seems to be uh, water to the mill because it, it establishes Trump as a narcissistic personality. And Trump needs to be seen as a completely narcissistic for his supporters to better identify him. So he becomes this father figure, which is uh, he has to be dangerous, and towards home, I think that's very, that's very uh, spectacular and good, towards home, only a passive masochistic attitude is possible. Yeah? That is the figure of the, of the father that dispenses punishment. But the punishment is always associated with pleasure. 
Yeah. So the pleasure becomes the punishment. And if you were disciplined as a child, or or let's say uh, beaten up in school, or physically punished, you grow up to associate punishment with pleasure. You become a very fertile material for this uh, for this passive buzz to develop this passive masochistic attitude. All it takes is someone to come forward and promise you this pleasure in return for obedience. So that is also um, he only possesses the typical qualities of both the individuals concerned in a particularly clearly marked and pure form and give an impression of greater force or more freedom of the libido. For that reason, the sex uh, rumors about Trump don't seem to help, but seem actually to help because they establish it as a powerful libido personality. And it becomes easy to project your repressed libidinal energy all the time. Now, we are, I, I'm not going to take uh, the whole two hours. I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, let's see if there's anything. Um, maybe just here. Um, because some people, some people ask after listening to the system, so what, did Trump study Freud? Did he go to school to study Adorno? How did he learn all these tricks? So Adorno tries to answer that. He says, I'm reading from the second sentence, the leader can guess the psychological wants and needs of those susceptible to his propaganda because he resembles them psychologically and is distinguished from them by a capacity to express without inhibitions, what is latent in them. By the way, it's not by joining accuracy. Uh, it's by a normal. Uh, this is just a uh, keynote. Helpful. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the leader simply turns his own unconscious output, his experience totally conscious to exploit this faculty, to make rational use <laughs> of his irrationality, similarly to the actor or a certain type of a journalist who knows how to sell their innervations and sensitivity. So here, I think Trump's training in reality television becomes incredibly useful in establishing um, fascist leadership, because what makes you a good uh, material for reality TV is precisely the ability to enact your unconscious in front of the camera. If you cannot do that, you're not going to make it in reality TV. If you can do that, the camera will rule out. And if you watch something like The Big Brother or any, any other reality TV program, uh, the most memorable characters are those who can turn in front of the camera and just let their uncensored stream of consciousness run. And a fascist leader is someone who has this ability to make their unconscious run free in front of the house. Um, what I have uh, missed, I think that kind of brings this whole thing together. Maybe I will just go back to my uh, three creeds and go with them, go through them again. So now we will see probably with, with, with additional clarity, uh, what they're talking about. So, in the past, information meant truth. And liberalism, democracy, are based on these principles. That, that information is truth and you can combat lies with extra information. But in daily technology, information is not truth. It is imagination. And people like Trump and other fascist leaders uh, understand that. And if you try to fight imagination with truth, you are going to lose. And the way power operates is by not by having facts on your side, 
but by having excitement on your side. And I just want to go to the third slide uh, and to, the, to this last point. Because the question is, as always, in many immortal worlds, what is to be done? Well, it seems to me, and that's why I wanted uh, my uh, head of the top of the equity uh, escape. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, this, I think, is the moment where art plays an absolutely crucial role. Because art can show that representation is not the answer. That the answer is to learn to become more sophisticated consumers of performance. To be able to, in the same way that in the 80s and the 90s, we learn to read images semiotically, and we learn to see how images communicate oppression and discrimination and power structures. Now, the image itself is a performance, and we need to learn how to understand uh, performative structures in the same way. The art can really show the way to a form of politics <coughs> that overcomes the boundaries between human and non-human and, and establishes collaborations between different actors all operating from their own such as hackers, programmers, with whistleblowers, psychotherapists, uh, scientists, and philosophers. And through this collaborative approach, a performative form of politics can emerge to replace the representational form of politics. And here I will uh, stop. Thank you very much. Being to explore. I think that's that where what artists should be focusing. What the, what the, what is an algorithm? How algorithms create realities? How algorithms create ways? Because the way we look at the tweets that Trump is sending every morning and every evening is not so much the linguistic messages, but the rhythmic codes. They are almost like I would say I would say they are kind of Program. It's a way to program the, 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 the psychological sphere that all the subscribers to his stream are plugged in. So, how that works, in what way these vibrations are, are happening? How is it possible for a message that comes out from one's phone to reach 25 million people? You know, what does it do to our understanding of information? It's clearly not the same information that we used to have in the past. And what is the difference? That's what I think is for us to figure out. Okay. Right. Yes. <clears throat> so I guess one of the things which was listening occurs to me is, is the challenge for liberties or democracy or whatever is that is that actually life is complicated and issues are difficult with lots of change of name and so on. And it seems to be very hard to, to, to translate that into the simple messages that performances. You see flashes of the people like um, Caroline Lucas who's beginning to do around Europe and, yeah. and, and creating a yeah. different narrative. But, but it's a much I guess there's a real challenge there, and that's why we've all been so long putting by yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well I don't know, maybe Caroline Lucas should work with artists. And maybe maybe some kind of collaborations between politicians and performers and artists will do, do or, or programmers will create an interesting result. I think we're definitely interesting in about making previously unimagined connections. I agree. And, and, and following through your, your analysis, it's, it's, it's about it's a, allowing the repressions to be to be a valuable part of society rather than something that uh, um, 
a problem, you know, and I was that tension in all of us, isn't there, that, that in a democracy somehow we collectively decided that there is this set of behaviors and so on, which is collectively beneficial to us. Yeah, yeah, that's that's where it gets complicated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Right, um, do you think that uh, Adolf Hitler also had uh, the first sexual desire so that he let up that accidental ants to do? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think Leotard, Jean Francois Leotard, has a very good book on that. It's called Heidegger and the Jews, if you could look at it. Um, it's beyond the scope of this lecture. I don't want to get into this question right now. Um, I don't know anything about Adolf Hitler, just as I don't know anything about Trump. I, I think what is uh, generally ill advised is to try to uh, analyze a person based on their uh, media statements. So, uh, so you know, that is something that I have no knowledge. Yes. How does someone have electricity in the Let me have the focus question. Do you think then that 
to pursue pleasure yeah. is to be selfish in a sense? Okay, that's a good question. Look, this is really interesting. It opens up a whole different direction. I think I can suggest some literature on that. I don't think any, any quick answer will uh, will help you, you know, because it's, a, it's but I can see what you want to study. Yeah, because then if you're, if there's that, what's selfish, you're Okay, you're still saying, isn't it really selfish to be interested in pleasure? No, but I'm saying that, like, it, there is a selfishness to it, but then that conflicts with, you know, people are supposed to be a part of uh, the communal, yes. but that's how we live. But then that's, that totally conflicts with it. Maybe not totally. I don't know. Look, it's complicated. But I think also there is a pleasure in. in in reaching out to other people. Collaboration is also a is also a point there. Okay, yes. I was gonna say um there was an article regarding yesterday about how uh, with the rise of fashion in Brazil, yeah. uh Bolsonaro is eradicated the power of career in the textbooks and power of career was being uh, famous for developing a theory of education. Yeah, which is not based on the the lone speaker in front of the class yeah. dispensing wisdom to the masses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yourself, you have just presented a fascinating called Mirror, <coughs> where you call the lecture fucking machines. You yeah. talked about Charles sexuality and fetish things. The slide you've got at the end, the draw note, um, not this one. It's yeah, yeah, the previous yeah. one. So if you can go back to that slide. Okay. You I'm say sorry. that the leader is a person who is able to energize the libido yeah. of the masses. Yeah. Um, in order to generate yeah. submissions and it's a part of it. Yeah. Um, I keep waiting for you to call the rug from under our feet or feel that you set this up because it's a reflective of the mirror. Is it or not? Who, uh, so who is the leader? Yourself, sir. Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, look, I think it's, uh, it's kind of it's obvious, isn't it? It, it? it sort of goes without saying. Uh, but uh, that a class, and Foucault is saying it in discipline punishment, a class is uh, is like school, is like prison. All these setups are uh, disciplinary. They are based on authority. And of course, the only reason you listen to me is because I stand here and talk about my pedestal, you know, and that indicates that I, you know, I have something interesting to say. But put me just among you in a crowd of people in a queue in the, to buy some tickets, for instance, and why would you listen to me? You know, um, just another another madman speaking. So that, that, that is all true, but I also think it is kind of um, self-evident truth. In my seminars, I mean, that, that is how this room is set up, but in the seminars I, I, I run with my students, we make a point of not having this kind of formation. We see, we're all sitting around a table, um, so we can look each other at, in the, at the face and, and have a conversation that goes not only vertically, but also in all, in all possible uh, directions. That's kind of... Uh, one way, but um, yeah, I mean, if, if there was a, a libidinal uh, excitation in this lecture, that would be considered as a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good place to finish. Thank you very much.